In my training and my specialization, counseling is a huge part of what we bring besides the technical knowledge right. and the science. We bring that, that counseling. And so I spend a lot of time, as I said, getting to know the story. So I'm sensitive to what those hot buttons are, where the barriers say, no, I'm not going to touch that. And so a lot of what I do is having the patient recap what we've learned and then what's the goal. Hi, I'm Haley Pomeroy. I am the Assistant Director of the Integrative Medicine Program at the Institute for Neuroimmune Medicine. I also have the distinct pleasure of being your host today for our podcast, Hope and Help for Fatigue and Chronic Illness. Today, we're very fortunate to have Dr. Stephanie Petrowski. Dr. Petrowski is an associate professor and the department chair of the nutrition department. She is also the program director for the master's in nutrition at Nova Southeastern. Dr. Petrowski, thank you so much for coming today. You have been an incredible mentor and an inspiration for me to advance my career in nutrition. So thank you. Oh, glad to be here. It's such an honor to see how you've grown the program and you're ex was, you were one of my best students so enthusiastic <laughs> always had something to say <laughs> always have something to say that's for sure and it's and it's great to get to interview you we integrate so many different things at the institute for neuroimmune medicine but i think one thing that all of our practitioners our physicians and really a cornerstone for a lot of our translational research is nutrition and so we wanted to have you on and talk about this very important topic. Can you share a little bit with us, all of us listening here, what, how, tell me a little bit about your career in nutrition and what led you to this career? Well, I have to tell you, and I'm sure this isn't a, 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 you know, a strange story to most of us, that it starts really with a personal connection. And I really got involved in nutrition years ago when I was a wandering undergraduate trying to figure out what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. And it was all about uh, random luck, taking a nutrition class, and then really taking the details of time of breaking down the food I ate and how it affected my health and really learning about human physiology and disease, but really about the motivation and the psyche. Um, I just fell in love with it. And it has been a milestone uh, part of my career for everything I did, whether I was working in senior living I was still talking about nutrition. If I was running health systems, I was still educating, uh, working with employees and um, problem solving life. So all of that was really kind of the skill set that I brought besides just staying involved in nutrition and so much innovation. So yes. that keeps me going. There's just too much to learn. It's like a big iceberg. I can't get to the bottom of it. Absolutely. And that comes, that is evident when I went back and got my master's, even though I had been practicing for years, I knew that I needed to, I want to use the word catch up or stay really connected Perfect. with what was happening from a nutrition perspective. And I, one of the biggest things that was exciting to me was how profound or it's becoming more common to see people use food as medicine and integrate that into a wellness journey or a wellness protocol. What are you seeing from a clinical perspective? Are you seeing a change where people are recognizing and acknowledging the power of nutrition? Absolutely. It's the it's the hottest trend in training health professionals. And it's not just medicine or it's not just nutrition. Here's what I love to say. Nutrition is a universal solvent. And that brings in the background in chemistry that you have to have with nutrition. But what that means is that nutrition crosses everybody's life. We have to eat to right. survive. But it also goes into the economical wellness. Uh, how does um, finances play and it goes to global and social consciousness. It goes into uh, working with people and motivation and, and trying to really get a sense of who they are and how they operate, what's happening in their lifestyle. And cultural too. Cultural is mean, huge. The diversity there. Oh yeah. My it's gosh. amazing. So it's not just about science and the clinical practice because the patient comes to the clinical practice, but it's really about the patient that we have to get to know. And there's a balancing of skills that really takes us to get to a point where a patient will trust that what you're bringing them is the right information. And sometimes by the time I get a patient that's been referred um, for nutrition consultation, they're almost at the end of their rope. Right. And sometimes I'm also the problem solver and the diagnostic 
personality trying to figure out what's really going on and who else do they need to see, you know, in this complex journey. So I really thrive in that team approach. And, um, you know, the food is medicine is a great experience for a patient that really wants to start taking back control. Think about this. In the 50s, I was actually looking at some old material the other day. Everything was about how you cooked food and presented food. And, and, then, and then all of a sudden, Slavery, over the years, yeah. it's disappeared. It's all drive through. It's instant society. And so we are now seeing the emerging technologies of companies that are putting food together in a box, yeah. all measured out so you can figure out how to cook again. And that's like what I call the the um, cooking renaissance is coming back. So what's really timely with that is that we're overlaying it on population health and chronic disease. And we're really trying to get at the bottom of you have to take care of yourself. It's a self-care model. And it's and it's really about time because I think or it's about time, not it's about having the time. Right. Because I think there's been some this crazy huge disconnect. I mean, we know science shows us that every thing that happens within our body is nutrient dependent. And we can get nutrition from either food or the sunlight. Other than that, that's pretty much it. Or supplements. Or supplementation. But that body's not designed that way. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. Although we are... Enhancing. Yes, yes, absolutely. But as a species, like as the human species, we're so disconnected from that. I mean, we for sure see that in our pet population. We right. see it in in agriculture and, and growth population. We supplement. We are very cognizant of our feed programs. We care how we feed our dogs and our cats often way more than how we feed ourselves. I always laugh. I was at a restaurant one time and this uh, gentleman and his wife were eating and he had this big, it was like a pastrami looking sandwich and a big plate of French fries. And they were eating and they had a dog. They were at a cafe outside. And the husband reached over to the French fries and put, went down to give the dog one. And the wife just jumped all over him and said, don't do that. That's bad for him. And she was passionate about her dog's yeah. nutrition. And I just thought, I just, you know, had this little moment where <laughs> but I you said. you didn't have a problem yeah, ordering it for exactly, your own meal. Exactly. Yeah. There's this huge, yeah. huge disconnect. That's such a barrier. Trying to help people. I was just having a conversation with one of my colleagues today is how the patient didn't even want to take the effort to make a hard cooked egg to try to have a healthier protein option. I can't tell you how many times I have taught <laughs> yeah. how to cook a hard boiled egg. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's an interesting one. And that seems so basic, right? right? Especially when we're trying to lay down protein and get nutrition into that. Let me ask you, are you seeing like when you're, if, is there something that you're seeing that seems to have a common thread with people that are coming in that are dealing with chronic illness, fatigue, exhaustion, maybe inflammation? Is there something that you're seeing? Are you seeing that they're completely disconnected from their food? Are they not getting nutrient dense food? What are you seeing in your practice clinically? Uh, it's a, you know, the complex patient is a lot of history taking. Yes. And it's never really just an instant solution. I, I like to say that a complex disease didn't happen overnight. So a cure, especially with nutrition, isn't going to either. But um, a lot of times, you know, again, the best environment is with a team so that everybody's giving input and we see all the different perspectives. But in clinical practice, typically the complex patient is in um, a state of, um, I would just say inflammation. It's that baseline inflammation, which comes from a variety of places, but I like to start at lifestyle and stress. Yes. Uh, you know, I do get to nutrition. Nutrition is so it's such a personal topic that people would rather talk about their bowel and sexual habits than they will about Isn't that their diet. And, so, and, and they would actually rather make all kinds of interventions yes. than to make take expensive supplements, take the shot, you know, and especially surgery. with all the weight loss <laughs> pills that are yes. coming on. Um, it's really a challenge because it's not sexy. Right. Nutrition isn't sexy no. unless you're watching the the podcast or the social media with all the bodybuilders, then it might get a little sexy. But um it's it's hard work. It is hard it work. It is hard work and it means just scrapping everything that you learn from your mom and in your family and you, maybe your lifestyles become so hectic with stress and job pressures and just trying to balance, you know, two generations the the children and the parents that uh, the patients in the middle they are sometimes trying to figure it all out and a lot of these complex diseases are traveling and they don't really have an, you know, direct connection. So I typically work up their, you know, their, their process with just really getting to know them. And I have to build that rapport and trust through 
really hearing their their story, how they tell that, where are they emphasizing, where are their barriers, what's their social support system. Right. right? So one thing that we find a lot is people that are struggling with illness. And when we're using a food prescription or we want to address nutrition, if we leave out the life mapping before we put in the meal mapping, right, we start to talk about what to eat, what not to eat before we look at what's realistic, we're setting ourselves up for failure mm -hmm. because food is it, healthy food, food that's going to make a change in the health trajectory of a person or a patient is going to require thoughtfulness and it's going to require effort. It does not come in a package typically. And it's, I mean, unless, like you said, there's these great innovative companies that are out there, but it's not going to come in highly processed foods, which are easy or fast yeah. food or attainable food for cheap and at a moment. So I always say we've got to look at the environment of their life, their stress, their time constraints, and see how we can fit into that first, elevate the nutrition level a little bit, because the more well-fed a person is, the more resources they have to become invested in their nutrition. So sometimes people are so depleted that to say, okay, I want you to go 100% organic, all whole food, and you're gonna eat you know, five times a day or 10 times a day or once a day, whatever the philosophy is that's adopted, sometimes the patient is so depleted that we've gotta see where we can sneak things in. Are you, are you finding that? We're, we're, we're just getting people that are just exhausted. Yeah. Yeah. The, the whole functional ability of a patient gets in, in the, the way there. So I, that's where, you know, the social system comes in. And right. a lot of times it's changing the individual's idea about what food is. Right. If it's always been prepared and packaged and, and from the freezer in the microwave, that's not the holistic way. There's good options now. The market's really driving consumer demand right. for better options, but there's a price for that. If you were to compare, you know, versions at the store, you know, those that have the more beneficial profiles are going to have that added cost and, right. and that's not necessarily good for the budget. And really that education of helping people relearn cooking habits. So the exhausted patient who doesn't have the energy, then I may use liquid supplements. I may use, um, you know, kind of the concept of cooking in bulk and, yes. you know, cook once uh, you know, eat twice or three times right. if you're good with the meal prepping, you know, um, we call it morphing meals too, yeah, morphing you know, how meals, to, how to yeah. make a roast and then make tacos out of it or make enchiladas yeah. out of it or yeah. Yeah. So there's a, there's a lot of education that goes on. So really my biggest job is education. I start with, you know, I bring a lot of background and experience and, you know, education and, um, specialization in clinical nutrition. And then I sit down with them and, and sometimes the conversation's wandering and they start telling me about their bowel habits. So I, I, I go down the GI track. Right. How, how is, you know, that, what does it feel like? What does it look like? I take out my stool chart, you know, I said, and this is a little offensive, but <laughs> what color is I that? Say, what what is level is that? You? Yeah. This is it's perfect. such a good message. And when they learn that they're like, Oh wow. And then right. I talk about the villi and I talk about, um, you know, just poor absorption and nutrients aren't working. And now you maybe need some enzymes so that the food can get in your body. And, and I get an opportunity to stick all kinds of uh, bits along the way. And then I see them change. They're like, oh, and then there's more conversation about, so let me talk about functional fiber and how that, if you could get the gut working, then a lot of these other symptoms tend to go away and you're getting nourishment in the way the body can use it. Right. I think that's one thing that's really, or for me, really stood out about the program that you've put together. Mm -hmm. And that's that, you know, we talk about whole foods and we talk about supplementation, but you're looking at the whole patient and how not only does food interact with them, but how they interact with food. Can they absorb it? Can they digest it? Mm -hmm. Can they take macronutrients and turn them into micronutrients and make metabolic magic, right? That was what was profound to me. And also, I'm going to jump into some of the cutting edge things that you were able to expose us to in our programs. When people are out here and they're listening to us, we want to be able to have hope, right, that that um, they can change their health trajectory. I want to just pull one gem that you said, which is they become a student of nutrition, even if they are a, a physician or a dog groomer or a stay-at-home mama or dad, they become mm -hmm. a student of nutrition. It is what feeds your life and the healthier it is, the healthier option your life can become. What are some of the things that you expose your students, us, to that we then can carry forth and expose hope for people that are a student of nutrition because 
they have to be for their own health. So the kind of cutting edge thing is, is that nutrition is really getting down into the level of genetics, you know, and I talked to you about chemistry and yes. solvents. So nutrition is chemistry in the body. Oh, that's the way the body communicates signals, upregulates, downregulates everything. So I in, love that it's not a bank account. It's oh not, my gosh. Yeah, it's it's a chemical chemistry. So you could biodynamic experience. You could speed things up, you can slow things down. Absolutely. And um, so the nature of food is really, I mean, if I, I'm a food first practitioner, so get food if you can holistically, but there are going to be situations that just need more of certain nutrients. So Targeted. key supplementation really right. is a good part of a good nutrition assessment. But this cutting edge piece of personalized nutrition is overlaying the genetics. So, you know, we have the chronic patients that we're treating and we're trying to get them back to baseline by just taking good, you know, care. But then those that are in the genetic pool of more chronic conditions, we'll say the young 30 that yes. have parents that have diabetes and cardiovascular. What do you do for them when you do your genetics and realize that you have that same genetic tendency? You could take a choice today. And you can upregulate or you can slow things down. And, you know, that's really where the lifestyle piece comes in, that awareness and the education. So uh, I think that's going to be huge because there's a lot of customized tests that are coming direct to consumers. So we're getting more information direct to the patient, saliva test, skin testing, just things that we can know where target nutrients. Even stool tests and yes. urine tests, what we're excreting. You know, exactly. That whole metabolic yes. output, that, that, yeah. that metabolic mill that's, you know, from what we take into what we put out, it is, is a constant evolution. So that is really helpful. Um, I also think what we're seeing in cutting edge is more on um, looking at interventions that are using uh, food as medicine instead of as a concurrent therapy, maybe as the first line of choice. Right. I've always known it. Yes. But now we're teaching our physicians, our, our PAs, our nurse practitioners that really it should be on the vital sign so, so when you're doing that. It, assessment. it should be. And I, yeah. I just had someone that called into us and they were talking about um, having a conversation with their practitioner and they actually were going to be referred to an OBGYN, but they said, you know, what should I do different nutritionally? They were trying to get pregnant. What should I be doing nutritionally? And he said, you know, besides a prenatal, there's really nothing you can do. It's just calories in, calories out. I just was heartbroken. Oh, there's so I, much <laughs> to do to optimize I know, fertility. I know, oh. I, I know right? Yeah. I was just going, oh, the opportunity that, you know, what you eat and what you supplement with, the opportunity. And, and again, we see that in every species, right? We, we, I'm a horsewoman, right? We we breed horses. We are diligent about our nutrition coming into that. And it was really heartbroken because it is changing. And so there, the question when they called in is, how do I communicate with my practitioner that isn't valuing nutrition? Do you have any like bits of mm. wisdom? You are always so good at putting things in a way I always walk out going, well, of course that's the truth. Of course oh. that it is. Uh, just kind of break it down. In a, simple, yes, in a simple yes, in a positive way that people can communicate. You know, maybe if they go in and it's the first time their lipids are a little bit high or their blood sugars are starting to creep up a little bit, how they can communicate that they want to become a student of nutrition for their own advocacy. What kind of verbiage can they use? So for the practitioner. Um, that's a tough question because there's egos involved, right? right. Really, there's sometimes a different perspective or right. we're limited on time. But for the for the healer that wants to really help and, you know, inspire that hope for their patient and everybody that I've met really, truly wants to get there. Sometimes we just get caught off or right. off, you know, off, off track a little bit. But I like to say, well do no harm. You know, you bring Love them back that. to the Hippocratic Oath, right? Do no harm. But maybe pour in a little bit of good. It's the same approach I have with my patients. When you sit down, you know, I hate that approach. Here's a low sodium diet. Go uh, do it. Yeah. I don't have time to explain it. I had my own experience this past week. My blood work didn't come back. I'm having a little bit of a, you know, situation. And and so you, we're all in with the electronic health record. Yes. My doctor reads the labs. She says, follow a low carb, low fat diet. Oh my goodness. And that was it. And I'm just like, she doesn't even know who <laughs> did, I am. Did you give her your business card? Yeah. yeah. We've, we've had years of talking oh about it. And goodness. I was just like, she's so caught up in the process Busy. Yeah. that she didn't think about the, the receiver. Right. So a lot of times I'll sit with my patient. It's going to be the same thing with her practitioner. 
we're on a continuum. Okay, here's where you are today. Here's where you really should be for the optimum results, but you, your journey is your own. So for the provider, really listening to what the patient's telling you in terms of concerns, fears, priorities, and I think they do that anyway, but we tend to be more prescriptive because we're just short on time. Right. So, you know, the referral to a more specialized person helps, but just breaking the ice with saying, um, you know, a good question. So how's your diet? you know, can leave that open-ended opportunity. Or if they know there's something that they could do in terms of um, leaving with uh, an action plan for the patient, maybe just start with the priority. So for every patient, I've got 10 things that I want to work on, but let's just tackle first things first. And that's the most thing that we're going to get the biggest bang for the buck. And then we'll come back next week and I'll call and see what we can add next. So I'm kind of thinking about breaking it down in steps towards that continuum. When, when we were, when we talked to, uh, we were talking to a group of physicians that were trying to figure out how to integrate nutrition into the practice. Some of the issues is, is it is a time consuming process mm -hmm. to understand what a person has the capacity for, what the need is in the body and what can actually happen. And one of the things we distilled it down, we were at this conference all together, was to ask your patient, if you could, what would you change in your nutrition? And it is profound what the response has been. People mm -hmm. say, I just wish I ate breakfast, or I wish I didn't have so much sugar, or I wish I ate before I had coffee. And a lot of times, if you can do that self-reflection or self-identification with the person. So we tell our community, and I'm suggesting that you guys do this, is define for yourself if you know we had a magic wand, what would you do differently in your nutrition? There's a lot that is probably filtered in um, that, you know, by something you read or something you heard or a study or a trial that you read that is innate in your body that you know would be better for you. And so sometimes defining that first and foremost, because there's 100% buy-in, right? And then going, okay, now how are we going to use food prescriptively? Yeah, that's actually a key concept to what I feel my skill set is that's a little bit more unique. There's a lot of misinformation out there about nutrition. Right. Okay. You got your bloggers, you got your influencers, and uh, a lot of information comes across the news. So looking for credible service, uh, you know, um, sources is really a, a key piece. So what are you looking? Are you looking at education bodies, government bodies, you know, or are you just believing what your next door neighbor told you? <laughs> But um, in my training and my specialization, uh, counseling is a huge part of what we bring. Besides the technical knowledge right. and the science, we bring that, that counseling. And so I spend a lot of time, as I said, getting to know the story. So I'm sensitive to what those hot buttons are, where the barriers say, no, I'm not going to touch that. Um, and so a lot of what I do is having the patient recap what we've learned and then what's the goal. So we may, we'll leave our session every time with a few goals, specifically, what are the things that are most important to you? Where can you make the change now that I've told you where I think the gap is? Where can you start? So identifying the gap is a big one. Oh, the gap. I, yeah. Sure. The gap, the gap, the gap. We yeah. Always... And then and putting them into realistic expectations. You know, people that come to me that are 30 pounds overweight, they want to be back to their pre-marriage weight, yeah. you know, <laughs> by the end of the month. And I was like, you know, that's not safe. And then we talk about ketogenic diets and we talk about some of these quick waste loss things that are very harmful. Right. Oh my gosh. So, I'm so glad realistic you said that. expectations yeah. is about time frame and what it takes and remembering you didn't get this way overnight. So the, the solution is going to take time too. There's a couple of very basic litmus tests that we say is if it's not something that you would be proud to share at a meal, you know, with people that you love, you wouldn't be proud to feed somebody else that don't do it to your struggling body. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Good the other point. is if it's not something that you would allow your kindergartner or your teen teenager, someone that's working on remodeling, modeling bone, building their immune system. Because when you're struggling with disease or chronic disease, you're in that same, you're trying to regrow a better, healthier balance. If it's not something you would proudly send off to lunch for your kindergartner and feel like, you know, best mom of the world award is coming down. Everything's all the, perfectly cut perfectly, yes, gorgeous. Little, all little boxes. Yeah. yeah. If you wouldn't do it to your kid, don't do it to yourself. Yeah. Right. From a nutrition Isn't perspective. Isn't that so true? Parents get so busy packing for their right. kids and then they eat on the run. Right. Or they grab a cup of coffee and they don't eat. And yeah. Skip a meal. I yeah. also, everything we do is nutrient dependent. So eat. 
I mean, that's another important yeah. one. I always say it's really an odd thing, especially in a person trying to change the disease process, is to expect to give them less and have them do more. And healing is a nutrient dependent mm -hmm. process. That's a great way to say that. Yeah. So it's a universal solvent and a nutrient dependent. Process. Yes, it's a universal. I love yeah. that. I love um, that. But the the whole way the body, the anatomy is designed, everything is to work in synergy. Yes. So, you know, the benefits of, for example, iron absorption can be enhanced when you really pay attention to mixing that spinach salad with some oranges. So citrus. The, yeah. The, a little bit of citrus. On your, yes. You know, so kind of knowing how to put Absolutely. food together. So it is going back to a lot of teaching about the basics of or, how do you cook? How do you shop? How do you stock your pantry? Just starting with, do you realize how much hidden sugar is in some of the foods that are causing the inflammation, you or, know, chronic or disease. trans fatty acids. Yeah. yeah. Labeling is terrible. So yeah. it, it, the whole food is better because it doesn't have to be packaged. We, um, we were talking the other day about why Bloody Marys have celery in them. And people use the celery salt instead, and it doesn't buffer the acidity like the fiber and the alkalinity of the celery. And so I just thought that was really funny. Or There's nothing better than that last bite of the exactly. celery that's been soaking up the Bloody Mary. <laughs> it Mary's. is. So there you go. There is food science among us yes. everywhere. Yes. To that point, many people don't have access to yeah. adequate nutrition. We are a starving nation that is well inappropriately fed. Mm -hmm. So we have all kinds of individuals that are, even with individuals that have had weight gain, that are so nutrient dependent when we start to layer in some of these testing that you were talking about, it's kind of shocking. We have food deserts, right? Areas where it's very difficult to get foods that aren't, that are fresh, that are accessible and available. I think having this conversation and people putting this to the top of their list as far as f priorities for changing their health, I'm hoping will be a huge motivation for some of this to change. What are some of the frustrations that you see clinically with accessibility? And 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 then I'm going to ask you just so you know, coming down the pike, how what are some tricks that we can solve that? Well, since we can't get some of our political dilemmas solved that easily. <laughs> Let's fix food. Um, well, that's it, not it's politicized. kind of related, you know, because my first, my first real concern is about the American insurance system. Right. That the priority is still on disease. And so nutrition is often thought of as a preventative condition. And right now, major payers don't take care of nutrition services unless it's really tied to a disease, particularly diabetes, uh, renal disease and a little bit of obesity, depending on the health plan. Right. And because health plans are all catered to different incomes and customer basis, sometimes health plans don't cover that at all. So right. it comes an out of pocket expense. Um, and then when you start asking people to pay for that professional cons you know, consultation, they say, I can't afford it. But then they're sitting there on their phone, their 5G, you know, super phone, and they've got a, a Starbucks cup, you know, coffee, and you just start thinking about all the other things that they give up in their life to have, you know, and, and so that's a, that's a, that's a perplexity about society that we don't have time to talk about, but, <laughs> but we will do that. We yeah. will do that. Oh, the, please. The, the true dilemma is, is really, um, sir, you know, there's qualified professionals that need to be accessible. And right. so sometimes it's through the portals or practices that you're working with. So having that team approach, really finding out, GI physicians often have a dietitian with them. For example, they see that as the healing benefit. Uh, the Neuroimmune Institutes, you know, really all their practitioners have taken on special credentials and they right. are doing a good job with their patient and, population. And not because they're bored, just so you know. And not <laughs> because, because they, they believe in the results. They, yeah. and, but I had Dr. Klimas say to me the other day, it's more than just believing in the results. It's we have to have solutions and this is an effective solution. And it's cost effective. That's, yes. you know, going back to what we see people give up. Or think about if you were to open up most people's cabinets in their kitchen, how many bottles of supplements are there? And every bottle's anywhere from 15 to 35 to $50 right. a bottle for a month's supply. You add that all up and you think about what kind of quality groceries you could buy for that if you gave them the skills, right? Yes, because the grocery stores are not designed for success. The fact that we have a healthy food section means yeah. what in the world is the rest of every other aisle, right? Yeah. If it's not healthy food, why is it in a food store? 
it should be in a synthetic. Yeah, that's that's a, that's that's plant. a whole yeah. lobby and uh, <laughs> industry thing. I that, agree. So there's a, there's a lot of good people doing a lot of good things. I'm focusing right now on trying to link uh, our students, our population, our patients with community programs. We do a lot of training in urban farming. So how can how can our larger community access that? Uh, there's, Where would they go? Basically, there's just a lot of great resources. You, you know, easy to search the internet for community garden programs. Okay. Community gardens. There's a lot of uh, food share uh, services where people are growing produce. And now it's always seasonal, so you may have some trouble getting blueberries if that's on your daily diet. But um, you know, for for really understanding local produce production. Uh, purchasing a CSA, which is a common shares of um, whatever's being produced. And they often have outdoor kitchens and they'll show you and, they'll and give ship. you recipes. They'll ship yeah. it to you. We, we, so the biggest, the biggest challenge we have in America is getting people to eat the recommended fruit and vegetables, vegetable Thank servings you. every day. If we could do that, if we could do that, we that do. would be like a huge public health initiative. And there's a lot of great programs in communities. Uh, for example, uh, Miami Gardens is one of the highest poorest, uh, poorest communities, but highest uh, obesity and uh, adverse health outcomes. They were able to get a huge grant and they have a whole community programming around getting healthier, walking safe neighborhoods, teaching people about healthy ways to cook alternatives. So there's a lot of great modeling programs that are happening, but they're little population right. things. So it's going to be grassroots coming to big scale. Right. And I think first and foremost is putting it as a priority. Absolutely. We have a lot of amazing scientists, amazing science, study and research that shows that it is very difficult, if not impossible, to turn a health crisis around outside of surgical intervention without the implementation of nutrition mm -hmm. because it's all nutrient dependent. Yeah, I actually teach uh, the medical students. I'm getting a lecture ready where it's the biggest longitudinal study that was done in the Journal of American Medical Association. It's been going on for about 15 years, and they release data every two years or so. So the latest ones we have is um, a couple of years old, but the top, the top chronic health conditions, the top 12 that lead to death and um, morbidity or just reduced quality of life are all nutrition-related Ex except for one or two that are, you know, motor vehicle accidents or Absolutely. something like that. Yeah. And so our physicians are learning how it's important to incorporate. I think uh, from the osteopathic side, it's very natural part of mind, body and spirit, um, which is, you know, a great way. But it's such a leading thing, you know, especially when you look at the cost of medications, you look at the side effects of medication and quality of life. And, you know, really influencing what they're doing with lifestyle. So stress reduction, exercise, sleep, those other factors all help the body in that synergy. So I want our community to have a takeaway. Let's just, I, I, we've been playing a lot and having fun with, I don't know if you've ever played with the carotenoid testing and nitric oxide testing mm -hmm. to see if people as an indicator to see if people are actually getting enough fruits and vegetables in. It's kind of a fun way to see yeah. what's happening. The I love those litmus tests. Oh yeah, yeah absolutely. And and they're, they're great. And it has been shocking when we've pulled large groups of people together that maybe think that they're doing an okay job even, how low the actual phytonutrients are in the body. They're not getting enough. How many fruits and vegetables a day? Well, the guidelines from the US dietary guidelines say at least five. Um, the best research, I'm talking like from the Mediterranean diet right. where it's, it's all uh, anti-inflammatory food um, and, you know, heavy plant-based eating patterns. It's, it's somewhere where between seven and seven nine. And, yeah, seven and nine. Seven and nine is where we want to be. But how do people do that realistic in their lifestyle? So it's got to it's got to be smart. It's it's got to be flaxseed on your strawberries. It's got to be soup that spinach yes. with the smoothie. I think the green smoothie is one of the greatest inventions ever <laughs> because if you're making it right, yes, if yeah, you're loading say, it up depends with on what you put it, if you're loading it up with it. a lot of uh, sweet juice, that's probably not the good idea. But it's a great way to get that phytonutrients in. Um, uh, some of the uh, you know, other suggestions that I use, uh, particularly around boosting foods throughout the day is just having it readily available. Yes. So when you go produce shopping, if you just throw it all the way because you're tired and you don't want to deal with it, it's going to be a week later, you're throwing it away in the same bag. We always say freeze it yes. and use it as a soup stock. So, yeah. or, you know, make 
customized small pieces like yes. veggie packs to go. Yep. So you got six for the week. You just grab them and go. It's a great thing if you're pressed for time to have one of your veggie bags, you know, on the way to work in the morning. Um, good, rich, healthy nuts are another way to boost uh, those polyphenols. But um, eat the colors of the rainbow it was a simple solution. We said many years ago, we've colors tried, of the rainbow. We've tried to make it so complex. I would love to have you back. I'm going to give our community the challenge to assess and see if you're getting, and we're not going to say five, we're going to, because we see it clinically, right? Five right. isn't cutting it anymore. Whether it's the nutrients, density of the food isn't as good, or the burden on the body is just bigger. Let's challenge everybody to just let us know, are they getting seven to nine servings in? And then make the commitment that your refrigerator is full of food you've packaged and not packaged foods. Let's That's get that freezer stocked up and have that crash stash, things that you can just make a healthier choice when you're feeling exhausted, fatigued, and depleted. Yeah, so. the, the, what to do for quick and easy meals, you know, right. kind of thinking out. And I'll, you know, say a lot of times that you, you said it's not a bank account, but kind of if you look at that in the analogy that you don't get, if you wanted to say, uh, say, save up $20,000 or you wanted to really make a financial plan for retirement, you don't get there by a big lotto ticket. Maybe somebody does every now and <laughs> oh, then. Oh, shoot. <laughs> but you have to do the work and that means planning and that means really setting those goals and, and making small steps to that big success and certainly collaborating with your team. And you one know? of the, one of, we'll, we'll leave you with this or I'll leave our community with this. One of the big differences for me, and I've been in the industry, it'll be 30 years now, kind of crazy, um, I started when I was 10. But one of the biggest things for me that set your program apart was looking at how the body engages with food, how food engages with the body, looking at what's possible for a client that's struggling. So non judgment. I mean, that was just so refreshing to come in from this perspective, meeting your patients exactly where they are, mm -hmm. but giving real practical tips that we know clinically can make a significant impact in health. When we've got an exhausted body, the reality is, is the grocery store, your restaurant, your fast food shop that you stop at is not designed to promote your health. And as soon as we recognize that and realize that we have to be kind of the antidote personally to that, then we can make the steps to make the change. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So please come back. Okay. Okay. This yeah. was great. I really appreciate it. And I, you know, consider you a dear friend, a mentor, and an inspiration to everybody in my community and in INIM's community. So thank you. Yeah. I appreciate the opportunity because uh, a lot of people don't think about nutrition in, in the way that you guys are really making it come alive. And, and I, I, I really, it gives me excitement and passion to be working with you and your patients and uh, happy to share all the good things that I know. Appreciate it. Save, save a life. Yes. Save, bring some hope around. Absolutely. Appreciate it. We'll talk soon. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.